All right. Well, we have been... Um, so oh, let me back up. So Evan asked me if I would teach. I actually get to teach. Today is, is the first of four... No, first of three weekends, three Sundays that I get to teach. Uh, three out of the next four, in fact. Uh, I won't be teaching next weekend because we have the VBS uh, kickoff uh, stuff happening during service. But it's been a long time since I've, I've been... I've had an opportunity to teach on a, a series. And so I want to give you a little bit of an overview of, of kind of where I think I'm going, and uh, we'll see how the Lord leads it. Um, but uh, before that, I wanted to just kind of recap a little bit where we've been recently in our, in our teachings that we've, been, uh, that we've heard over these past many weeks. Uh, Evan has shared with us, Pastor Evan has shared with us that uh, a word from, uh, the word for the year he believes for our church is found in Ephesians 4. And it essentially, it talks about that as each of us is uh, as each of us engages in and really fulfills the role or in the in the design that God has for us as individual believers in the Lord, that um, we grow up into uh, in, in full measure into Him, into Christ. We grow up to essentially to be more like Him. And He, uh, Evan, had you know mentioned just that that old uh, years ago that old. Um, uh, well, you had the bracelets that said WWJD, what would Jesus do? And it kind of got a little sort of uh, played out, you know, kind of commercialized, but that it's a really great question that, that, um, that, that would essentially be the answer to a question that's a, it's an answer to another question of, Lord, how do I grow in you? How do I grow in Christ? What would Jesus do? How can I be more like him? And there are a lot of different kinds of things that can get kind of in, in the way of that. And so Evan has his, his wonderful um, object lesson over here, this little brick wall, and he's talked about the foundation. He's talked about the individual bricks and the mortar that goes between that holds it all together. Last week, Steve talked about, Steve Schober talked about um, growing in the activity or the ministry of Jesus in this, in this world. And uh, he, ref, he read from a passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 4 that, uh, where Jesus was quoting from the book of Isaiah when he said that, you know, I've come to, 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 to set, set, the, set free, set liberty, uh, provide liberty and freedom to those who've been captive and, and to heal, to, heal the, to give sight to the blind, to heal the sick and, and, and all of these different kinds of things. And there's a ministry kind of activity that's available to us and that God um, invites us into as we, as we grow in Him. And what I want to talk with you about this morning is something that I, I, I think in, in uh, its own way fits in with this uh, overall picture, this overall theme of what it is to grow in, in Christ. And so um, that said, uh, hopefully we'll get there by the, end of the, <laughs> by the end of the message and we'll see a little bit of a connection um, and how it fits into the, to the bigger picture of of growing as uh, Jesus' disciples. All right, so we're going to start with a, a passage of Scripture, and we're going to read in, uh, from Mark chapter 11. You can go ahead and turn there if you have a, have a Bible with you this morning. And I'll give you a little context to kind of uh, just sort of set the, the, the scene for this, this passage. So this is a, a story of Jesus entering the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and prior to that, he is entering the city of Jerusalem, and he's riding in uh, on, a, on a donkey, on a colt. And it's remarked, you know, how that was just so opposite of what people would, would imagine that a king, you know, a coming king would, that, he would have like more, he should have more fanfare than that than just to ride in on this lowly, lowly donkey. But, but that's the way that he enters, humbly. And uh, not, in, not in the book of Mark, but in one of the other gospel accounts of this story, I can't remember if it's Luke or Matthew, there is uh, more detail, uh, there's some detail given to what Jesus, how, what his observations were as he entered the city of Jerusalem. And as he entered the city, essentially, the kind of the short sort of Reader's, Reader's Digest version of what he saw, what he, what he saw was that it was, um, it was a he was saddened to see the state of things and where people were at just in their understanding of their life in, in God. <clears throat> well, in this particular uh, passage, he's coming into, he's, he's already come into the, where we're going to pick it up, he's already come into the city and he's going to um, head on into the temple. Okay, so we're going to read beginning verse in verse 15 in Mark chapter 11. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned tables, the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he taught them, he said, 
it is, is it not written, my house will be called a, prayer for, a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And go ahead and read that part again. Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So with a story like this, as with many in the gospel uh, narratives, we have um, a relatively brief description of something that actually happened. Um, and I want to talk about this, this passage for a little bit in terms of what it literally is communicating, a real event that happened in an actual physical location that Jesus entered into, the things that he saw, the people who were there, the activity that was going on, and his response to all of that. And I do, and I, I will also talk a little bit about, meta, uh, um, uh, so I want to suggest to you as well that there is application of this story and the principles in the story uh, to our own lives as well. So I want to look at it as a metaphor, but we will get there, um, we'll get there a little bit later. So what's happening though in this story? When I read the gospel accounts, I, I often kind of, I have this, I, I have a picture in my mind that's kind of like a snapshot. And You might have even seen like an artistic rendering, a painting, a picture or something like that of this episode of Jesus entering the temple and driving out these people. And and that's kind of like, that's kind of what we get from this passage. It's not a lot of detail. Um, There are important details there, but it's kind of on us to to think a little bit more creatively about what's going on and to, to place ourselves in that setting so that we get a better idea of what's happening to use our imagination, um, not to add things to the story that, that somehow would, would, would lead us into uh, heresy or, you know, something that was conflicting with Scripture, but, but to imagine what was the setting like, what was going on here. And part of that uh, Im- imagining and kind of reading between the lines and filling in the blanks requires that we look to other parts of Scripture to give us uh, more insight so that we can understand a bit better what is going on. So um, we're going we're gonna to take a few minutes to, uh, to do that. So, so first of all, I want to talk about the people in the temple in this episode and the activity that was going on there. So the first people that we, uh, that we see that, are intro- that we're introduced to in, this, um, in these verses uh, are money changers. So why, what is a money changer? Why are money changers in the temple in the first place? That's a good question that you know, for us, to, for us to ask. Well, the money changers were just that. They were changing money for people as they walked in. But why, why would they be doing that there? Why would that even be something that people wanted to do? Well, at, that, at this particular time, the, the, the kingdom of, uh, well, I shouldn't even really call it the, the kingdom, but the, the area of Judea, in which, which, uh, which is where Jerusalem was, was under Roman rule, under Roman rule. And what we, what we wouldn't know if we, if we didn't know a little bit about the Old Testament Scripture and the kinds of things that God asked of his people before they entered into the temple was that there was a half uh, a shekel offering that people would bring in. It was a coin that they would bring in as, as an offering. And it was really kind of like a, it was, it was like a required part of entering, being able to enter, enter excuse me, the, the temple. So that was their currency, their denomination as, as, as the Hebrew people. But now they're under, uh, they're under the rule of the Romans. And the Romans have a whole different type of currency, right? For any of us who have ever gone out of the country, whether you've gone to Mexico or Europe, you know that there are different currencies in other parts of the world. And you have to, uh, in order to, if you want to go buy, ca- uh, buy something with cash at a store, you've got to tr- trade in your money, get, to, get an exchange. And oftentimes you're charged an exchange Right. There's a, there's, a, there's a fee that's, that's charged for you to be able to get the money that is the working currency of that area. Um, so this is kind of, it's kind of interesting how this is, this is back, this is sort of, uh, it's similar to that kind of thing, only the, the native money of the people that, they, that would have been their currency is no longer like circulating, I guess, because they're, in, they're under Roman rule. So in order for the people who are going into the temple to be able to get the, the, the shekel that they're going to contribute as an offering, they actually have to interact with a money, uh, money exchanger, a money changer, to get, uh, to, and give them the Roman currency. I think one of, the, one of the currencies that you read about or the types of coins that you read about in the Gospels is a denarius. It has, it has uh, Caesar's, you know, Caesar's face on it. And so they have to, um, 
I don't know, actually, I don't know. I, I've never seen one. I don't know if it was his face or if it said Caesar engraved on the back or exactly what it was, but there was, but, but it was the Roman, it was the Roman currency. And so the people that are going in there in order to get the shekel offering coin, they have to give their denarius or whatever the coins were that they were using that were Roman. And then in return, they get this shekel or this half shekel that they then can give as an offering. Well, though they're getting what they need, in order to give their offering, they're getting ripped off in the process. So these guys, uh, these money changers, have surveyed the situation, and they see, you know, of course, many of these people that are coming in, you know, being under this foreign rule or, or poor, and they don't have a lot, and they, they see an opportunity. Here's this person who is going into the temple, and, you know, I'm not really clear on all the things, maybe, that, 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 they're, that they're all about, but uh, I see an opportunity here to make some money on them. And so there's money being made. It's really a profit-driven uh, motivation, a profit-driven activity that these money changers are engaging in. And the next people we come to are some people who are selling doves, birds. That's actually what it's referring to. Uh, and that was another, it was another thing that if you go way back into the old uh, Levitical law and you read, some of this, you read some of this stuff, you'll see that another thing that people were asked to bring as an offering when they entered the temple were uh, doves, actual birds. And apparently at this time and, we're, and in this region, it wasn't easy just to go and find a dove, you know, hanging out on a you know, stop sign. I don't know if they had stop signs back then, but hanging out wherever they would be hanging out and, and bring it into the temple. Uh, they weren't readily available, and, and so some enterprising kind of entrepreneurial people re recognize this need. Oh, these people are going in to the temple. They need to have these doves to bring as offerings. I know where to get them. I'm going to bring them in. I'll have a cage of them ready to go so that people can come in and buy them, and I'll make sure to charge them a lot of money. So in order for these earnest, sincere people who are desiring to come into the temple and provide their offering to be able to do so, they, had, they essentially had to be ripped off, or they were ripped off. They received something, but as they were receiving something, something was really being taken from them as well. And so that's a little bit about of the scene of what's going on, uh, a little bit more about what's going on in this, in this, uh, this storyline. In another one of the accounts in the gospel, another gospel account of the same story, it's mentioned that there's actually, there are actually cattle, other cattle in there, other animals that people are selling uh, for, for, you know, for sacrifice. And, and, and if you read just this story, again, it's kind of like a snapshot in your mind, but, you know, imagine if somebody took the time to make, a, you know, a five-minute movie scene on this. There would be a lot more detail, wouldn't there be, of the other kinds of things that were going on. I don't imagine it was just one or two money changers, one or two people selling doves. Sounds like there was a lot of activity happening in this place that was meant to be a place of worship of the Lord, a place where the people of God would come into, um, would have a touch point with him, would have a place to commune with him, with the God who created them. Okay, so that's, again, what's happening in the actual story. Well, it's helpful to know as well a little bit more about the temple and its significance. And if you go all the way back to the, almost to the beginning of the Old Testament, in the book, towards the end of the book of, of Exodus, we see uh, uh, several chapters that give instructions that God gave to Moses about building the tabernacle, tabernacle. And we can really kind of think of those as synonymous terms, tabernacle and um, temple. The thing is, is this, this particular time in the history of, of, of Israel, the the people were, they were nomadic. They were moving about. We, we, probably many of us have heard the stories of them, you know, living and wandering through the desert. So the tabernacle was designed not to be this physical, or excuse me, it was physical, was not to be, not designed to be this, uh, this set uh, physical location that didn't change. It wasn't, you know, built on a foundation. It was just kind of built, uh, set up there on the ground. Um, and it was done so purposefully so that the people could pack it up and carry it with them when they went on from where they were to wherever the next place was that they were going. It was a way uh, for them to bring the house of God with them. And that's really what the, temple, uh, what the temple represented. And really, that's what the temple was for the people of the Old Testament. And remember, or, or under the Old Covenant. And remember, even as we read these gospel accounts, that's still really the Old Covenant. 
right? Jesus is on the scene, but there is yet to be the completion of the work that he came to do. So the activity that's happening in, this, in the story that we read is a similar kind of activity that, uh, let me, I'll back up, the, the activity of coming to the temple and, and, offer, and giving offerings it's the same kind of thing that would have, been, would have been happening for many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before that. <clears throat> so it was a tabernacle that could be packed up and carried with them wherever they went. Well, what, what, was, what was the tabernacle? What, what was the temple? It was a physical place where people went, but it was by God's own design and constructed according to his very, very specific instruction, it was his house. It was the place where he chose to dwell uh, amongst the people. Not that it could contain him completely, right? After all, he is the creator of heavens and earth. He is the one who is, you know, outside of time, outside of even outside and beyond his creation, right? It's hard for us to conceive of what that even means or looks like. But he chose to make, him, to make himself known to his people uh, and to provide a touch point or a place of communion with him, coming together with him, in the tabernacle. The tabernacle was, was, a, was, an, was again, was an actual physical place that had an entry point to it. And, and, but even deeper within the tabernacle was a place that was called the Holy of Holies. And that was a place that was so special that was the place that, that God really actually made his presence known to the people. But that place was so special and so, so pure that only the high priest could go in there, and he could only do it one time per year. And only after making sure that he was adorned uh, to the T, according to the design of all the priestly garments that he w- was to wear, and after he had uh, performed his own uh, uh, sacri- uh, sacrifices and all of the different kinds of things that needed to be done in order for him to come into God's presence. This was a very, very sacred and special place. And that was, again, the, the tabernacle of God for God's people during the, all the times of their wanderings. Later on, you'll read in 1 Kings, I think, chapter 6, Solomon takes on finally building an actual temple that's meant to, be, that's meant to stay in place you know, on a foundation, and, and so on and so forth. But the instructions in both, both for the tabernacle and for that physical uh, temple that are built, or that, that more permanent temp- temple that are built, uh, those instructions are incredibly detailed. There is, they're very precise in terms of the dimensions, the measurements. They're very, uh, they're very explicit in the, uh, what kinds of materials are to be used and, and what kinds of, of, of uh, you know, valuable metals are to be incorporated into it and so on and so forth. It was a place that God wanted to communi- by which God would communicate, not only is this the place where I will come to uh, um, inhabit with, amongst you, but I want you to know it is a sacred place. And there are a lot of conditions about, uh, that you need to follow in order to enter into it. Okay, so that's the, that's the temple, the tabernacle and the temple. <clears throat> so I mentioned to you before that, uh, that I, I see in this story that we read, Jesus coming into the temple, uh, something that I think, a principle that I think can be applied to our own lives. So how in the world does this connect to us today? We know that Jesus came to this earth. He, he lived among people. He was God in the flesh. He was fully man, fully God. Uh, things that kind of defy our, our logic, but, but he, was, he, was, he, was, he was man and he was God and he walked among us. And as he did that, he went about doing things like we read about today. Uh, he went about doing, uh, doing good, the Bible says, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, setting people free, healing people who were sick, casting out demons, teaching people, and not just teaching them by word, but by action, how he lived his life. We know that Jesus was uh, not liked by a lot of people because of his claim to be equal with God and because he called them on their hypocrisy. We know that Jesus went to the cross for that, he was crucified on a cross. He died a, an agonizing death. But he also rose again and, and showed himself to his followers for, for many days afterwards and then ascended to heaven. Up until this time, there is a physical temple 
uh, by which and in which people would go to bring their offerings to God to commune with him. All throughout the history of God's people leading up until that point, we see, all, we see time and again these stories, these accounts of the temple falling into disrepair, of people using it for unrighteous me- means. But now Jesus has ascended to heaven, and we come to this really uh, incredible passage of Scripture in, in 1 Corinthians 6, which you can turn there if you'd like. I'll read it. First Corinthians six. Okay. Verse fifteen, first Corinthians chapter six. Do you not know that your bodies are members? Christ himself. The context of this whole passage, if you might even have a little heading here uh, on yours, it's this, this, the context or the title of this little passage here that the, the, the translators added in when they compiled the scriptures is sexual immorality. So that's the context of what this, what's going on here. Um, jumping ahead um, to verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. And he goes on to say, therefore, honor God with your body. You, do you not know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit? You and I as believers, as people who confess Jesus as Lord, who follow him, are are the temples of his Holy Spirit. There is no longer a physical location, a physical building that we need to go to in order to encounter the Lord. Yes, we come to a physical place here each week that, where we come together as a congregation and we, and we participate in songs of worship and praise to God. But God is not limited to this place. Would you agree? We are the temple. We carry around with us a place that God has decided, I will inhabit you, I will share part of me with you in the form of my Holy Spirit. I will indwell you wherever you go. Wherever I go, we carry around, we carry the Lord with us. It's an amazing and and kind of mind-boggling thing to think that the God of all creation, the one who created all things, the creator of heavens and earth, would choose to make his home in us. And there's no longer any set of, of, of sacrifices. There's no longer uh, all of this kind of, uh, of these, these just crazy list of activities that need to be done in order to earn entrance into that place. He indwells us. He indwells us. And what I think is, for me, a vulnerability of reading this passage of Scripture in, in 1 Corinthians 6 is that there is this this. this specific context of sexual immorality. Honor God with your body. Paul is addressing a specific kind of activity that, can be, that we do with our bodies that was not bringing glory to God when he's writing this letter to the people of the church of Corinth. But this is true regardless of what the context is. He's made a statement, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God indwells you. So honor God with your body. Worship God with your body. And when I think about this passage, I realize a couple of things. One is that I have access to him, to my Heavenly Father, at any time, at any moment. I don't have to go to church to do that. I don't have to wait for a corporate time of worship to do that. Yes, those times are very valuable and very meaningful for me, and I, I look forward to the time that we have together to do these things as a, as a large, larger church body, as a larger family. But each and every day, everywhere, or everywhere I go, I can be in communion with God because he indwells me with his Holy Spirit. But we are temples uh, of the Holy Spirit. The other thing it makes me think about is that I can do a lot of things with this, this body, this being that he, is, that he has given me. And when I get in my car to, to drive myself to work in the morning, 
I can, that can be a time that I use to glorify the Lord. Whatever it is that I'm doing, wherever it is that I'm going, I can honor God with all of me. Do I do that really well all the time? No. <laughs> I, I, I miss a lot of opportunities to do that. But it's available to me, readily available to me and to you. But another thing that occurred to me is when I think about my body being a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, that includes this brain inside my, my head. I don't know if you can hear that knocking sound in the audience or on the recording, but it's not hollow, okay? There's an incredible brain that God has put in my head and, and, and in your heads. And I realize that so much of the activity that I engage in and that I think of as and realize is a form of worship to God, of sacrifice to God, kind of, it's kind of starts here. Whether it's words of praise that I speak to him, words of encouragement that I speak to somebody else, whether, it, uh, whether it's things that I say uh, to, to another person to, I don't know, to ask them questions about what's going on in their life, all of these things really originate from this, this space, this landscape up here of my mind. And I want to talk a, a little bit about something that it just seems like for me, whatever, what, for whatever reason, and maybe it's part of just kind of my life message, because I find that regardless of what passage of Scripture I teach on, whenever it is that I get an opportunity to teach, it seems like inevitably I come back to this, the same theme over and over and over again. And that is the theme of the thoughts of my own mind that proclaim things about my identity and about my worth. And if things go the way that I kind of have it laid out in my mind, we'll, we'll talk the next time about um, the way that the things that I entertain in my mind shape my view of God that may or may, or may not actually be lined up with what the Bible says. But today I want to I want to spend a little time talking about the kinds of things, the kind of activity that goes on in my mind, and I know that it's not limited to me. Because I've heard other people say things uh, that uh, the kinds of things that I'm going to give you some examples about in just a, in just a little bit, <clears throat> and I've certainly heard uh, these kinds of things in my own mind as well. <clears throat> but before I get to those specific examples, I want to state what I think is kind of like the, one of the main uh, understandings that I hope that you can grab a hold of this morning. And that is that in the very place, if we think about this, this, this story of Jesus uh, coming into the temple and driving those people out who were, who were perverting the temple, the, the, the purpose for which it was created, and taking advantage of the people, we think about that, that situation. The very place, the very, the very place where people were coming to have an intimate connection as much as they could in that time with the Lord, their God, at that, in that very place of, of, of an earnest desire to bring themselves fully to the Lord, to, sacrifice, to bring their sacrifice of themselves to the Lord, these people were taken from them. In the very place of that uh, point of connection, they were getting robbed. Things were being stolen from them. They were being sold something that, well, it wasn't a counterfeit dove, but they were, being, they, were being, they were being taken advantage of in a way that they, didn't really, they couldn't really uh, get out of because they knew what they needed to bring in order to be able to enter the temple. And so they were being, they were being robbed in that very, very place. And the connection that I make for my own life is that this place, this space up here in my conscious mind where I have the thoughts that I have and where I think about uh, what is true of God, where I remember the things that I've learned about him, where I think about the things that he's done in my life. In this very same place, there at times are thoughts that are so incredibly counter to the truths that are in Scripture. And so the kinds of thoughts that I'm, I'm talking about are things that perhaps you uh, you have heard others say, uh, uh, or and maybe uh, you have heard yourself say, or 
have heard run through your, your mind as well. Things like, I'm so bad at this. I'm so dumb, stupid. I'll never be able to, you know, fill in the, fill in the blank. Why can't I just get it right? I'll never, yeah, never gonna, I'm never going to be able to do it. These thoughts that are so conclusive about who we are, and yet when we look in a, in a, in a little bit at some scriptures that's, that talk about our identity in Christ are so incredibly sharp in sharp contrast to, to the things that God says about us. Things that, that communicate some, like, uh, some, some statements that I need to earn my acceptance. I need to prove my worth. And you might not think those, those uh, you know, think those exact phrases or say those exact sentences, but, but the kinds of things that we end up allowing to influence our, our thinking oftentimes speak to issues of our worth and our, our value, our identity. How about this one? Yeah, um, I'm, just, I'm, just not a, I'm, just, I'm just not a good, I'm not a teacher, so I, I, can't, I can't really share the word with people. Or I, yeah, I know that, that that person over there, the people that are up front, they can, you know, they can talk about things of, of God, but I'm, I'm just, I'm not really good at that. When in Scripture, it's very clear that we are all messengers. We are all meant to be a light to the world. We are all people who carry Jesus in us. We're made in the image of God. What kinds of conclusive statements uh, have you made? Or have you heard others make along these lines? How about this one? You're talking to somebody, or maybe it's you yourself who said this when someone's talking to you, um, and they say, or you say, never mind, it's not that important. And maybe that's true. Maybe it wasn't that big, it wasn't really something that was fitting for the moment. But, but how many times have I uh, been tempted to, to maybe think that thought in a conversation with somebody or heard somebody else say that when really what the statement is being made is, it's all, never mind, I'm not that important. Or why would, you know, I, I, won't, I don't want to talk to that person. I, I'm, I don't think that what I have to say is that important. Translation, I don't know, is it, am I really important enough to ask them for help? I, um, I teach in a alternative high school, and um, one, of the, one of the things that we focused on a lot this, uh, this year and, and actually the last, the last few, few years is, is this idea of fixed versus um, growth mindsets. And the idea of a fixed mindset is that I am who I am, and that's it. I'm not changing. And not that people would really say that, but, but this is a really common one in, in math class. Oh, I'm not a math person. I'm, I'm just not good at math. And it's amazing when you see a person who makes a statement like that, if that's what they buy into, it can be very difficult to teach them anything. <laughs> um, that's a, that is a fixed mindset. Um, whereas maybe somebody that you could help to say, yeah, well, I'm not really great at it yet, but I'm working on it and I believe that I can get better. Uh, there's an, that's an incredibly different statement than to say, I'm just not good at math. And what we, and this fixed mindset, growth mindset stuff is based on fairly recent uh, uh, scientific research on the brain that has shown that the brain can grow. It can, it can change. It can change. It's malleable. Uh, people can learn things, even if they haven't been good at them for most of their lives, they can really, we can learn th new things. Even well into our adulthood, we can still continue to do that. And the learning mechanism that's at work there um, is something that just blows my mind, quite frankly. But it's kind of, it's, it, essentially the learning mechanism is really a, a strengthening of connections, a strengthening uh, of signals between neuro, uh, neurons, between brain cells. That's what, that's what learning really is. And it's a little bit, there's a little bit more to it than that, and it's way more complicated than I'm describing, but essentially that's what's, what's going on there. And if you can think about it like this, that as we learn something, it's kind of like when you, when you want to increase your, your internet speed and you upgrade your, your, 
DSL or your cable internet or whatever. It's like a picture like getting a, a, a fatter and fatter and fatter cable, cable that is uh, capable of, uh, of carrying a, a, stronger, a stronger signal. And when we, when we learn patterns the, of thinking, it's, it's kind of like that. That the, the thought that I have, for example, if I think, yeah, I'm just not really very good at that. You know, I can repeat that actually uh, out loud verbally and, or just think it or both. And as I do that, it's like that, that bandwidth is increasing for that signal and it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And uh, scientists actually understand that this is really how, um, how addiction works as well. Addiction is really a type of learning that your brain does. Now, there are other chemicals that, that are involved with that, especially with certain types of substances, and the, and the response is, is much stronger, why, which is why addictions are, can be, you know, to, to substances can be so hard to break. But it's essentially the same kind of thing that's happening there. And if you, um, if you and I encourage you to do this, if you walk down to our lower parking lot, as you get down, if you walk down the right fork, down to the lower parking lot, just right as you come into the parking lot, you're going to see two little riverbeds that have formed over the last many weeks of storms that we've had. And they, they really are. They're like little, like you could get some little army men and put them up alongside, maybe get some Hot Wheels cars and put them down in there. And, and it's very, it's, it's amazing the power of that water that wasn't a rushing flood. It was just this constant... Uh, persistent, quiet, kind of almost unnoticeable trickle of water that over the course of many, many days wore a very distinctive groove into the ground. And that, for me, is a really great picture of how patterns of thinking in my own mind can find their way into a, a, a nicely carved groove that just allows that message to keep going and going and going. And, and, and that's a, that's, there's really like physiological stuff that's happening when we, when we, ha when we think uh, things like that. Now, I'm also very thankful to be part of a church where we understand that there are things that we cannot see with our unaided eye, and even with a microscope or a telescope, there are things that are happening in a spiritual dimension that are beyond uh, our ability to perceive with our natural uh, senses. And, and as a church, we've been taught well over many years that there is an enemy of our souls. There is spiritual activity that is not good. There is, uh, uh, there is demonic work that can influence our, our lives. And I believe that thoughts like this, I'm not good enough, or I'll never be able to, or for me it was, I don't know what I think. I don't know what I mean. I, I, don't, I don't know. Because when I was in third grade, I had an experience with a teacher who uh, who really embarrassed me in front of a whole group of students of my peers at a very, like, fragile time in my life. And, and, and the teacher said, when I answered a question, the teacher said, no, you, you don't know what you mean. And for many years, that shaped how I thought about myself and what I, what I knew, what I could be confident in. Now, I didn't repeat that statement voluntarily, but I believe that at that moment, there was something spoken to me uh, you know, and this, and this teacher, like, apologized later. My mom met with her, and she was very apologetic and was very kind with me and understanding about the time of life that I was in following my parents' divorce. Um, and, and things really changed, but there was something that, like, just like that, that was, there was a crack point in my soul where I believe the enemy got in, and it, it was a, it was a, um, uh, a yeah, it was a, it was a statement, a powerful statement about my identity that was false, but that led me and directed me and guided me actually for many, many years after that. <clears throat> and so we have in our experience the reality that there, the things that go on that influence us aren't just flesh and blood. But I find it actually really helpful to know that in addition to the work that the enemy can do and the demonic forces can, can uh, uh, cause to happen in my life, that there's actually a pattern uh, there's actually something that's happening that, that science explains too, and that the combination of these two things make it very difficult sometimes to break out of those patterns of thinking. At our church, we, we believe that God is in the, the business of setting people free from, um, from oppression, from thoughts about yourself that 
that, that um, define you incorrectly, from uh, uh, things that weigh you down, from anxieties and depression and fears. And I've been delivered from many, many such kinds of things. In fact, I remember one, uh, one day, many, many, many years ago, when we had four services at this church, two on Saturday night, two on Sunday morning, and I was up here to give a teaching kind of my early on in my, in my time on staff here, and I, I was petrified. I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't put my thoughts together. I didn't know what was going on, and I, would, I wanted to leave. Like, I really wanted to leave after first service. And uh, someone noticed that, that, that I was, that I, they, could, they could discern that I was having something going, there was something going on that was, that was much deeper than just what was apparent on the surface. And, you know, long story short, they prayed for, this person gra- grabbed a couple other people, they prayed for me, and they prayed against a spirit of fear, and like that, it was broken. And the, the rest of those, those three following services was, was, the experience for me was so much different than what, what that first service was. Um, does that mean I never felt nervous? No, I feel nervous every time I come up here, whether it's announcements or teachings. Uh, I don't think that, I don't know, that I, I mean, I know Daniel Brown, our founding pastor, has acknowledged that every time before he teaches, he's nervous. It's normal to be nervous when you're speaking in front of a group of people, but I don't have this fear that grips me anymore. And I know it's because there was a sovereign intervention of the Lord that broke something spiritually. Having said that, there still can be that groove worn in my body my brain, as it were, there still can be those connections that are there that will be sort of like, that's going to be like my go-to when things get a little challenging. And this helps me to understand a little bit more why sometimes when we get prayed for and we, and, and we experience deliverance, that we still sometimes are, um, we still find ourselves challenged in that area. So I get set free from fear uh, about, you know, being in front of people or fear that I don't know what I have to say. Um, but that, that pattern, that pathway is still there if I allow that signal to continue uh, to, to, find its, to find its way. So these statements then that are contrary to um, God's, what God says about who we are they have, one of the effects that they have is causing us to draw away, not, not voluntarily, not in rebellion, but they cause us to draw away from the truth of God. Because if I'm buying into something that's a lie, I am not moving towards or embracing something that's, that's true. I've accepted something else in its place. And it doesn't mean that my faith is invalid or I'm a bad Christian or that everything's falling apart. But I've made a place for these kinds, this kind of thinking in different parts of my, uh, or yeah, in different in, in my mind in different areas of my life. So here's something that to, to counter what those kinds of statements would say. We'll read one verse together, and then I'm just going to kind of rapid fire uh, uh, several others to you, just to to remind you about what the Bible says about our identity in Christ. And we're going to look at John chapter one, Gospel of John chapter one. Okay. John chapter 1, verse, we're going to start in verse 10. He was in the world, this is referring to Jesus. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world uh, did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, <clears throat> excuse me, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. We are children of God. In his uh, first epistle, John uh, later says, See what an incredible quality of love the Father has shown to us, that we would be called children of God. And indeed we are. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, God created them in, in, in his image. We are created in the image of God. We've heard it. We know it. We can believe it, you know, kind of intellectually. But what does that really mean? We're carrying around part of the identity of God wherever we go. And things that we allow to disqualify us or slow down our, our progress are things that are, 
are in contrast and are contrary to that, or in opposition to that truth. David says in Psalm 139, verse 14, I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. We, we read in Ephesians 2.10 that we're, we're his workmanship. The word there in the Greek is a, we're like a poem. We're like this incredible, beautiful work of art that he has created. And Peter, and, and Peter says in his first epistle, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a consecrated nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. In Ephesians 1, uh, uh, verse 5, it says, He predestined and lovingly planned for us to be adopted to himself as his own children through Jesus Christ, in accordance with the kind intention and good pleasure of his will, to to the praise of his glorious grace and favor, which he so freely bestowed upon us in the beloved, his son, Jesus Christ. That's the uh, Amplified Bible uh, rendering of that verse. And again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, which we read before, do you not know, do we not know that our bodies, our beings, are temples for God's own Holy Spirit? What's Jesus' response to the unwelcome activity in the temple of our own minds? I'm going to read a, one, one more passage here and, and wrap it up. You don't have to turn too far because it's in the first chapter of John. Excuse me, second chapter of John. This is another account of Jesus clearing the temple. John chapter 2, verse 12. Uh, excuse me, verse, we'll start with verse 13. John 2, 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? It's a little stronger of a set of details than in the first passage that we read, right? All the gospel authors have kind of their own angle, their own bent, the things that are part of their, their, uh, their life story, their, their life message. John chooses to focus on the intensity of Jesus' response to those who had infiltrated the temple and really perverted the use that it was intended for. Those who were taking advantage of people who were earnest in their desire to seek the Lord, to come into a point of communion with him, to be uh, in his presence. And he, he cleared it out, is what he did. And so I, I just want to ask you as we, as we close service this morning, where are there places in your, own, in your own thinking where you have concluded, you've made conclusive Thought, you have conclusive thoughts that you are, th- in this particular way, you are this thing or you are this way, and that's just it. Where are there, there, there are places in your own mind where you have allowed, where I have allowed very unkind, very untruthful thoughts about our identity, who we are? And where are there uh, opportunities that you have or you can think of a family member, a coworker, someone else who, who says things that, that, that falsely define them? And what are you going to do about it? What do I do about it? And part of what we're learning as we, we, under, as we learn about growing in Christ is that there are some practical kinds of things that we can do, practical hyphen spiritual things that we can do. Um, and we're going to learn more about those in the weeks to come. But I would say to you, if, if this resonates with you in, in any partic- particular way, that you don't just leave it, you don't just let it kind of be, you don't leave it here when you leave the building today but that you really talk to the Lord about it, that you talk to a friend, that you talk to a small group leader, that you talk to your spouse if you're, if, if you're married, that you talk to a pastor who you, who you, who you know here, and, and, and find out and let them know what's going on so that you can get, you can have an experience where that, that place that God has designed for you to really commune with him is more and more free of these things that, um, yeah, that complicate and that make very difficult your, uh, your interaction with the Lord who made you. Okay, let's pray.
Well, Lord, thank you that you have made us in your image. Thank you that you, um, you are uncompromising when it comes to the things that uh, threaten to, to, to paint a different picture of who you are than, than who you actually are, that would preach a different gospel, whether it's one that, that we need to kind of earn our own way or our own significance or that, um, that we're not deserving or, not, uh, or that we're in- invaluable. Um, Lord, we know that, yeah, none of us really truly deserves everything that you have given to us, but the point in understanding that is not for us to, to come to a place of, of just feeling like we're bad and, and, and that we don't have any value, but you want us to know that we are incredibly precious, incredibly value and valuable, and that anything that says otherwise is something that needs to go. And I just wonder if, there's, if this is something that has resonated with you. I know I, I gave you some specific kinds of thoughts, uh, things that you could do about it. But I, I'd love to just give you an opportunity to just acknowledge, just like look up at me, show me your hand. Just that, yeah, this is something that, that I can connect with. This is something that I'm familiar with. And uh, yeah, I see you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah and Lord, I... I thank you so much that you see each of us. And even if we don't talk to somebody else, you see us. But Lord, what an incredible um, group of people that we get to be part of here at the Coastlands that, that we have, we've got people we can talk to when it comes to things like this. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us to move out and uh, beyond where we are right now. And that give, us, give us those practical uh, steps to take as we, as we, in order to do that. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for your grace, Lord, that makes our access of you possible in a way that is unlike uh, anyone had ever experienced prior to what Jesus did on the cross. And the new covenant that we live under, Lord, that we live in, you live in us. And we praise you and thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, everybody, well, thank you. Uh, enjoy the rest of this beautiful day. And... Um, We'll see you next week. All right.